right, the year is 1967. The United States is, is engrossed uh, with President Nixon in a Vietnam conflict war. Israel is getting the feeling that they're about to be invaded in late May. And the reason they feel that way is that President Nasser of Egypt has asked UN peacekeeping forces to move out of the Sinai Peninsula, the Sinai Desert, the only thing between him and Israel. To his surprise, the UN peacekeeping forces actually moved out of the area. Now he had to back up what it was he said he was going to do, namely raid Israel. President Nasser of Egypt had befriended and formed a bit of an alliance with then the young King Hussein of Jordan and Assad Sr. in Syria. So you have three nations, with the help also of Iraq, that want to invade Israel. And tensions are building, and the Israelites are well aware of the fact they're about to be attacked. Remember, they're very young as a nation. The morale in Israel is so low that the national parks are being designated as burial grounds for the massive amount of Israeli casualties that are expected in this war in the invasion of Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. With the peacekeeping forces out of the way, Israel realizes the only way they can actually have any upper hand in this war with the military they have and the armor that they have is a preemptive strike. The prime minister of Israel addresses the nation and leaves them with less confidence than they had before the address and a bit of fear and a hopelessness that the Mediterranean itself would be filled with the Israeli blood. Meanwhile, in New York City, a rabbi from Israel is making a speech at a conference and injects this hopeful message to his people back home that you are under the divine protection of God, you do have hope, and you will overcome your enemies. Morale begins to build among the Israelites. Many Israeli soldiers are sent home on leave for the weekend, the reinforcements, creating the illusion that Israel is not ready for war or doesn't take the threat seriously. <coughs> Early in the morning, Israeli jets take off toward Egypt. They are picked up on Jordanian radar, and a Jordanian radar specialist through the chain of command, sends a message to Egypt that Israel is about to attack them from the air. Oddly enough, the code word for attack from Jordan to Egypt was changed the day before, so the wrong word is being sent. Egypt never gets word that they're about to come under attack from Israel from the air. The anti-aircraft guns in Egypt, in the Sinai Peninsula, are never, no one understands this, ever given an order to shoot at the Israeli planes. The Israeli intelligence of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, has ascertained a consistent problem in Egypt concerning its airfields. The night shift lands on the ground while the early morning shift that flies around Egypt to protect her is on the ground as well. So the entirety of the uh, Egyptian Air Force is on the ground at the same time for a period of 30 minutes. It's during this 30 minute window of time that Israel attacks in three waves the entirety of the Egyptian Air Force and annihilate 298 planes in one morning, leave craters in the runways to prohibit any other planes from taking off because of their intelligence and because of the manner and, and the code word being changed. The Israeli military had figured out how to turn an Israeli fighter plane around between six and eight minutes to refuel, to replenish the pilot and to get him back in the air. Three waves of Israeli pilots annihilated the majority of Egyptian air force in one moment, one morning. The total number of Israeli soldiers was 275,000. The total number of enemy combatants was 456,000, almost a half a million. The enemies had two times more tanks than Israel and four times more airplanes at the start of the conflict. Now, what's interesting, too, is the Israelis had figured out how to cross the incredibly difficult terrain of the Sinai Desert. The Egyptians expected them to come down one of two roads across the desert, but the Israelis, after much prayer and, and really figuring this out, decided that their cars and their vehicles would not get stuck in the sand if they let a certain amount of air out of their tires. They also modified the treads on their tanks and fortified them with more weapons than they were originally designed to do. 
And it's under that kind of um, strategy that Egypt was hit and hit hard very early on in the war. There's one testimony of one Israeli tanker, in, tank shooting in battle throughout the night, only in the morning at sunrise to see a brigade leader of the Egyptian tank force come with a white flag and surrender in front of that Israeli tank. Surrender his entire brigade to Israel. Asking the Israeli tank commander where the other 40 or 50 tanks were that they battled throughout the night. He says, I'm the only one. To this day, nobody can explain why they surrendered in the manner that they did. Israeli forces walked into Shechem, a historic town of their patriarchs and matriarchs, and with the confusion of the Arabs that were there, the Arabs that watched this Israeli army walk into their town, waved at them from the windows, thinking that they were Iraqi in nature. They took the town without a single shot. A spy by the name of Eli Cohen, an Israeli, infiltrated the Syrian government and got to some high levels of authority in the Syrian military as a spy and went through the Golan Heights and surveyed the fact that Syrian soldiers were bunkered in three tiers in the Golan Heights and that the soldiers were exposed to the hot sun. He instructed as a spy who invaded the Syrian military that trees be planted, eucalyptus trees be planted near those bunkers so that the soldiers wouldn't get heat stroke. When the Israelis invaded the Golan Heights, they only had to drop bombs where the trees were actually growing to hit the Syrian soldiers. So there's an incredible amount of strategy and cunning. There are stories of clouds and fog descending at strategic times to mask the Israeli army and lifting at times to expose the Syrian army. West Point military commanders don't even study or teach from the Six Day War in Israel because it's ridiculous to think you could duplicate the kind of miraculous events that took place, like winds blowing over minefields. At the end of the day, it was too much to actually explain. Even the secular Jewish military commanders were placing scripture in the Wailing Wall. For the first time in 18 years, the Jews had access to the Wailing Wall when they took it back from the Jordanians. Even the secular military things could not even explain how they won that war in six days, except by the intervention of God. The Israelis in that six day war had 760 casualties, their enemies 18,000 casualties. Israel ended up with 33 to 40% more land after the Six Day War than they had when it begun. And remember, they began the conflict thinking that their national parks would be graveyards. In the years to come, not a lot of publicity about this, but the Temple Mount was given back to Jordan, or the, the, the Muslims, and the Sinai Peninsula was given back in part to Egypt. Therein lies the miraculous intervention of God as promised in the Old Testament as they repopulate, repurpose, and regather themselves as a people with a revived language in a land they're not supposed to have, surrounded by people that hate them. But yet, in six days they fought, and not unlike Genesis, on the seventh day they rested. The miraculous events of the Six-Day War of Israel. And there are others. The War of Independence, Yom Kippur, the War of Yom Kippur in 1973, and they go on and on and on. God uses Israel to teach the world of what his nature is like. Fascinating.